Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Browsing through a book of quotations the other day, I came across the old Scottish prayer to ward off evil spirits. You remember, from ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night. <laughs> well, isn't it strange how the coming of night can alter the whole shape, appearance, even the atmosphere of a house or a room? Sounds are different at night, too. Anyway, reading that old incantation, I was reminded of the tragic case of Raymond Hewson. It's an odd story which I've called the waxwork, so let me tell you about it. Some years ago, I was working on a film in London. One evening after we'd finished, I decided to take advantage of a little free time before a dinner engagement and to walk back to my hotel exploring London as I did so. I'd been walking for about an hour when I came across an inviting-looking pub in an alley just off Baker Street. I went in and ordered a glass of beer and a sandwich. No sooner had I got my drink, enjoying the early evening atmosphere of the place, than I was surprised to hear someone calling my name. Vincent! I say, Vincent! Oh, good Lord, Raymond Hewson! <laughs> well, I haven't seen you for years. Yeah, that's right, not since, um... Oh, not 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 since I, I did those extra bits of dialogue for that film. Yeah. Um, what was it called? Um, oh dear! Uh, the thing without a thing, or oh. some such name. Oh. <laughs> well, well, well. I must say, it really is the most amazing coincidence running into you tonight of all nights. In fact, in a, in a way, uh, you might say it's providential. Raymond was a spare, pale man with lank brown hair, and although he spoke plausibly, even forcibly, he had the defensive and somewhat furtive air of a man used to being snubbed. He looked, in fact, exactly what he was, a man gifted somewhat above the ordinary, who was a failure through his own lack of self-assertion. He made a living as a freelance writer, and like most freelance writers, he was always hard up. Indeed, when he spoke of our meeting as being providential, I half expected that he was leading up to asking for a small loan. But that night, Raymond had other things on his mind. You see, I've, ar I've arranged to spend tonight, all night, <laughs> in the Chamber of Horrors at the Waxworks round the corner. I'm hoping to write a piece about it and, you know, get it published. Now, if I could work one or two observations from you into the story, it'd be a great selling point. Um, do you mind? Oh, no, not at all. Look, Vincent, I know you're very busy, but, um, I wonder if you'd mind doing me a favour. Oh, anything, my dear chap, within reason. Well, all I want you to do is come with me to the waxworks and see me settled in. No, it won't take very long. It's only a few minutes' walk. Well, I do have a little time to spare, and I must confess that I, I find the idea rather interesting. Oh, good for you. Well, now, look here. Let me buy your drink, and then we'll go round to the waxworks. Um, now, I have an appointment with the director, Miss Frayne, at half past seven, so we've just got time. You must realise, Mr. Hewson, that there's nothing new in your request. In fact, we have to refuse it to different people at least three times a week. What kind of people, I wonder, would want to spend all night alone in a waxworks? Oh, mostly foolish young men who've made bets or who are trying to prove something to themselves. Do you always refuse? We do, I'm afraid. You see, if some young idiot were to lose his senses, we should find ourselves in a most embarrassing position. Of course, in this case, your being a writer, Mr. Hewson, somewhat alters the situation. I suppose you mean that writers have no, no senses to lose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But one imagines them to be responsible people. You can't know many writers, Miss Frayne. <laughs> and, of course, in your case, we have something to gain. Publicity. Publicity. Um, yes, well, uh, that brings me to another point. I think I know what's coming. Well, I have, in fact, already been in touch with our advertising manager, and he has agreed that in the event of your article being published in one of the national dailies, you will receive some payment from us. Raymond, how do you intend to treat the story? Well, to make it gruesome, of course. <laughs> um, well, gruesome, but with just a saving touch of humour. But I don't have to tell you anything about presenting horror with humour, Vincent. Well, perhaps not. I think I get the general idea. Well, Mr Hewson, I wish you good luck with the story. But first, I must warn you that it is no small ordeal that you are about to attempt. 
And I confess that it's not something I should like to do. May I ask why? It's so difficult to explain. But I'll tell you what. Come along now and see for yourselves. But I warn you, Mr. Hewson, that if you are at all susceptible to atmosphere, you are in for a most uncomfortable night. Oh, that's all right. Newspaper editors never stop telling me I've no imagination whatsoever. <laughs> Although Raymond appeared to take the whole affair lightly, I knew him well enough to realise that he was not looking forward to the ordeal. He was obviously down on his luck, and I rather think he saw the whole thing as a last desperate gamble. These thoughts crossed my mind as we followed Miss Frayne through half a dozen rooms where attendants were busy shrouding the kings and queens of England and those others whose fame or notoriety had rendered them eligible for this kind of immortality. I've asked the porter to make you as comfortable as possible, but don't expect too much. I've also given instructions for the figures downstairs to remain uncovered. Through here, gentlemen, please. Oh, before I forget, I must ask you not to smoke. We had a fire scare here this afternoon. I don't know who raised the alarm, but whoever it was, it proved to be a false one. Mind your heads as we go downstairs. Miss Frayne led the way down an ill-lit stone stairway, which conveyed the sinister impression of giving access to a dungeon... On reaching the bottom, we passed along a small passage in which were displayed a few preliminary horrors, such as relics of the Spanish Inquisition and a pair of early English stocks. In turn, this corridor opened into a dimly lit room with a vaulted roof. It was by design an eerie and uncomfortable chamber, the very atmosphere of which invited its visitors to speak in whispers. The waxworks figures stood on low pedestals with numbered tickets at their feet. Seeing them elsewhere without knowing whom they represented, one would have thought them a dull, even a shabby-looking collection, but gathered together in that sinister room. Ooh. Well, here we are, gentlemen. Recent notoriety is rubbing shoulders with all the old favourites. Perhaps you recognise one or two of them. This, of course, is the famous Dr. Crippen. Insignificant little fellow, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Over there is Wilkinson, the strangler. And there you see a tableau depicting the murder of the two little princes in the Tower of London. It's a very dark Tower of London. Oh, yes. I'm sorry that I can't give you any more light, but that's all there is. For obvious reasons, we keep this place as murky as possible. Good Lord. Who's that over there? Ah, yes, I was coming to him. That's one of our star turns. A present-day murderer who has never paid the price for his crimes. The figure which Hewson had indicated was that of a small, slight man, not much more than five feet in height. It wore waxed moustaches, spectacles, and a voluminous cape. There was something so exaggeratedly French in its appearance that it reminded me of a stage caricature, something out of one of those delightful bedroom farces by Fede. I, I could not say precisely why that mild-looking face seemed so repellent, but I found myself instinctively taking a step backwards. Nasty-looking character, isn't it? <laughs> Who is it? That is Dr. Bourdette. Bourdette. I've heard that name recently, Bordet. I can't remember in what connection. You'd remember better if you were a Frenchman. For a long time, he was the terror of Paris. He carried on his work of healing by day and of throat cutting by night. Oh, yes, I remember now. Wasn't it said that he killed people for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him and always with a razor? That's mm. right. After his last crime, he left behind a clue which set the police on his trail. In fact, they soon amassed enough evidence to send him to the madhouse, or the guillotine, on a dozen capital charges. But I, I thought you said... That he was never caught. Oh, he was caught, all right, and tried and convicted. But somehow he managed to escape and cheated the guillotine. One or two crimes of a similar nature have taken place in London quite recently. But then it's queer, isn't it, how every notorious murderer has imitators. Anyway, most of the experts believe that he is quite definitely dead. Well, I don't like him at all. <laughs> oh, and those eyes. Whew. They seem to bite into you. Yes, don't they? This figure's a little masterpiece. 
It's excellent realism, really, for Baudet practiced hypnotism and was supposed to mesmerize his victims before dispatching them. Oh, I see. I, I was wondering how so small a man could have managed to overcome his victims. Well, it was mesmerism. At least there was never any sign of a struggle. Do you know, I, I thought I saw him move. Oh, come on now, Raymond. No, he moved, I tell you. Oh. <laughs> oh, You'll have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect, Mr. Houston. But remember, you won't be locked in. You can come upstairs whenever you've had enough of it. There are watchmen on the premises, so don't be surprised if you hear them moving. I've told them you're here, by the way. Raymond, you quite sure you want to go through with this? Of course. And I think it very mean of you not to have offered to stay with me. Oh, oh that wouldn't be fair, Mr. Hewson. You must be quite alone. Well, don't think I won't mention you in my story, Vincent. Though I may as well tell you that I shall feature heavily as the hero. <laughs> Raymond, I assure you that even if I didn't already have a dinner engagement, I should still be only too happy to let you stay here all night by yourself. This place gives me the creeps. Well, Mr. Houston, I'll wish you a very good night. And so do I, Raymond. A very good night and a successful story to celebrate tomorrow. Why don't you give me a ring, hmm? I'm at Jameson's Hotel in the Strand. Thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Well, good night. Good night, Mr. Houston. And thanks for tucking me in. <laughs> and so we left him. And after a quick, and I must confess, welcome drink in Miss Frayne's office... I went back to my hotel to get changed for dinner. It must have been at about three o'clock the next morning that I received an urgent telephone call from Miss Frayne asking me to return to the waxworks immediately. And this is how our night watchman found him. He thought he heard somebody scream and came down here to investigate and immediately rang me at my flat. And I'm afraid that when I found what had happened, I rather, well, panicked and rang you. You see, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have his home number or anything. I understand. Have you notified the police? It's usual, you know, in cases of sudden death. I did think of it, sir, but I thought it better to ring Miss Frayne first. I could see at once it was uh, too late to call a doctor. I'm afraid I didn't think too clearly. Oh, how awful. This is the sort of thing we've always tried to avoid. What will the directors say? Well, there's time enough to let them know later. Have you any idea of... How it could have happened? Not at all, sir. I just heard this scream like and came running. I noticed Raymond's notebook lying on the floor by the tape recorder, which had run out. I began idly turning over the pages. And what follows is my own interpretation of what happened from the time Miss Frayne and I had left him on that fatal evening. Why don't you give me a ring, hmm? I'm at Jameson's Hotel in the Strand. Oh, thanks. Yes, I'll do that. Well, good night. Good night, Mr. Houston. And thanks for tucking me in. <laughs> right, now, let's get organised. Now, let me see. Um, notebook. Pencils. Tape recorder. Working order. Flask. Yes, mustn't forget that. <laughs> oh, God, it's cold down here. I wish I brought a blanket. Now, <clears throat> now rough notes first and then record. Yeah, I should get a nice, creepy, atmospheric piece. Might even flog it to the BBC. Right. Um, the dim, unvarying light fell on the rows of figures which were so uncannily like human beings. The air in the chamber was stagnant as the water at the bottom of a standing pond. <clears throat> good God, what's that? Oh, good evening, sir. Startled you, did I? I'm very sorry. Uh, Miss Frayne asked me to bring down this chair for you. She thought it might be more comfortable than the one you've got, sir. Oh, God, you made me jump. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does get you like that down here, sir. <laughs> Creepy, that's what it is, sir. Creepy. Uh, now, sir, where would you like this chair? Over here by Dr. Mordet? Uh, no, no, not there. Um, no, just leave it over there in the gangway. I'll put it where I want it later. Oh, very good, sir. Uh, will this do? Yes, thank you. Well, sir, I'll wish you a good night. I'll be upstairs if you want me. 
Oh, and uh, by the way, sir, don't let any of them sneak up behind you, sir, and touch you with their clammy hands. <laughs> Good night, sir. Stupid old fool, he'll give me a heart attack. Now, where to put this damn chair? Um, by the little Frenchman? God, how those eyes dig into one. Now, I know, I know, I'll sit here with my back to him, then I won't have to look at his face. Why not? I'm not afraid of him. Or am I? Come on, come on, Hewson. Come on, come on, come on, old son. Your nerves have started playing tricks already. He's only a waxwork. They're all only waxworks. What was that? Something moved. Oh, come on, come on, this won't do. <clears throat> now, where was I? Yes, yes, stagnant as the water at the bottom of a standing pond. Yes, that's good. Now, uh... Note here. After a while, it seemed as if the figures moved when not being watched. That there was not a breath of air in the chamber to stir the curtain or to rustle a hanging drapery. There. Good. Now that's fine. Now, clean it up and get this bit on tape. <coughs> the dim, unvarying light fell on the rows of figures, which... Hello, something moved again. I could swear it. It's Crippen. Every time I take my eyes off him, he moves. Damn it, they all do. Have a drink. Oh, that's better. All the same, it's not good enough. I'm going upstairs. I'm not going to spend the night with a lot of shifty bloody dummies who move when you're not looking. Now, what's the time? Half past one. Oh, I've got six more hours. I'll never do it. <clears throat> What's that? It's Crippen again. I nearly caught him that time. You better be careful, Crippen! And all the rest of you! I'll smash you all to pieces! You hear? Do you hear me? Why don't I go? Why should I sit here scribbling when I can write all this up tomorrow? Who oh, no. <clears throat> What's that? Oh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Now. <clears throat> I'm Raymond Hewson, freelance writer. I've been here in this chamber of horrors for, what, a few hours. My nerves are beginning to play tricks on me. And that's all they are, tricks. Oh, I'm a living, breathing man, and all around me are statues. Dummies. They can't move, and they can't whisper. Neither can they breathe. But by God, one of them is. Somebody else in this room is breathing. Dr. Baudet, you moved. Yes, you did. Damn it, I saw you. Good evening, monsieur. I was right, you did move. Quite right, my dear friend. And now, let me get off this ridiculous... Platform. Don't come near me. Really, Mr. Yusson, let us not be uh, melodramatic, huh? Ah... Oh, that's better. One gets so stiff standing in the same position all the time. I need hardly tell you that I never expected to have the pleasure of a companion here for the night. Oh, what the devil are you? My dear sir, I have no illusions. <laughs> I'm not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. I am Dr. Boudet himself. 
But I, I don't understand. How, how, how do, do come I to... come to be here? Let me explain. You see, for some time now, I've been living quietly in England. Well, late this afternoon, as I was passing this building, I saw a policeman regarding me uh, somewhat too closely. So I uh, mingled with the crowd and came in here. And when I entered this chamber, I uh, saw at once my means of escape from the so inquisitive policeman. I don't understand. Ah, you have no imagination at all, sir. It was so simple. I raised a cry of fire, stripped my effigy of the cape, hid it, and simply took its place on the platform. Et voila! But you must have been there for hours. Didn't anyone notice you? One small boy only. He screamed and said that he saw me moving. I understood that his parents threatened to give him a good hiding on his return home. I can only hope that the threat has been executed to the letter. So you really are, Dr. Bourdette. What a scoop. A scoop? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, we shall see. And to think I nearly packed up and went. Fancy missing this. What a story. Dr. Bourdette. The French Jack the Ripper. A slight exaggeration. But, but why do it? Why commit these awful murders? Ah, you see, the world is divided into two classes. The collectors and the non-collectors. The collectors collect anything according to their individual tastes. I collect throats. Uh, no, no, do not attempt to move. It is useless. You cannot move unless I say so. Uh, but, but my notes, I must get all this done. And I'll, I'll never have another chance like this. <laughs> exactly. You have given me the opportunity of gratifying my uh, somewhat unusual whim. No, no. <clears throat> You, 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 just hold on a minute. Ah, oh, but you have a skinny neck, sir. If you will overlook such a personal remark. And now, now you, you look here, Dr. Bloody Bordet. If, if you think I you can... I never have selected you from choice. Oh, I like thick necks. Thick, red, meaty necks. Uh, but enough talking. Enough talking? I haven't even started yet. I'm not alone here, you know. I've only got to shout, and the watchman will come running. And where will you be then? Uh, this is a little French razor. The blade you observe is very no, no, look, narrow. Look, 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 look. Uh, uh, <clears throat> look. I promise not to say a word about you being here, and not to use the story until... Does the razor suit you, sir? <laughs> well, we shall look, see. Look, I, I, I won't use a damn story at all. No, sir. Your appeals are useless. You are now completely no, no, look, under my I, control. I, I'll, I'll, you I'll, cannot I'll even speak unless I tell you to do so. Now, you will please have the goodness to uh, raise your chin a little. Huh? Uh, uh, ah, thank you. Oh, uh, just a fraction more. Huh? Ah. <laughs> Merci, monsieur. Merci. That is... Parfait. Poor Raymond. When I had finished reading his notes, I turned my attention to the tape recorder. Of course, the batteries had run flat hours ago... But the ever-obliging Raymond had brought along his own replacements, which were lying conveniently at his feet, unused. Carefully, I rewound the tape and switched the machine over to playback. Standing there in silence, the three of us listened as the tape played, 
hoping perhaps to find the answer to Raymond's sudden death. When it had finished, we stood there looking at each other, puzzled. Then I rewound the last few moments of the tape and played it again. And only then did I understand. Now, you, you, you look here, Dr. Bloody Baudet. If you think... Enough talking, I haven't even started yet. I'm not alone here, you know. I've only got to shout, and the watchman will come running. Where will you be then? Look here, look. Uh, <clears throat> look, I, pr I promise not to say a word about you being here, and, 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 and not to use a story until... Look, I, I, I won't use a damn story at all. <laughs> the waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places, waiting to be admired by the crowds who would soon wander fearfully among them. In their midst, in the center gangway, Raymond Hewson sat still, leaning far back in his armchair. His chin was tilted up, as if he were waiting to receive attention from a barber, and although there was not a scratch upon his throat, he was cold and dead. His previous employers had been wrong in crediting him with no imagination. If anything, he had an overabundance of that particular commodity. As I left that sinister chamber, I glanced back. Dr. Bourdet, on his pedestal, watched the dead man unemotionally. He did not move, nor was he capable of motion, but then, after all, he was only a waxwork. One thing, however, still troubles me, that laughter on the tape. Of course, it could have been on the tape already. It has since, I confess, crossed my mind that perhaps Miss Frayne had added it, hoping for extra publicity. Perhaps I thought that was why she had not called the police at once. But these thoughts I dismissed as being both ungallant and impractical. But what else could explain it? The alternative is too awful to think of. Could it really have been the waxworks, those vacant, staring effigies laughing at the fate of Raymond Hewson? Could it? I wonder. How to see ghosts, or surely bring them to you? This part of the book is for children who were born in the morning or around lunchtime. If you were born at midnight, some say just at twilight, you were probably born with the gift of being able to see ghosts and other spirits and don't have to be told how. Of course, all cats, dogs, horses, and roosters can see ghosts, but lots of people cannot see ghosts, even though they can usually hear them. And lots of people don't believe in ghosts because they say they never saw one. So anyone who wants to see a ghost, here's how. If you really mean it, if you really want to see a ghost, go walk around a grave 12 times backward and the ghost will rise and ask you what you want. Some people say that just walking around the grave will raise the ghost and some say you have to do it backward 12 times. Or, if you want to summon some one particular ghost, go to his grave at night and call him by name. He will rise and tell you what you want to know. Some ghosts can be summoned by music. If you sing or play some piece of music or some special musical instrument that someone loved, especially during life, the ghost will come to see you. Some people say that you can raise a ghost by whistling. You might... And you might not. It has happened. Once a man was walking along a road at night, whistling some tune, and a ghost fell into step beside him, whistling the same tune. You can call back some loved ghost by too much grief and weeping. 
Almost any ghost will come back to comfort those they love and stop their weeping. The poor souls cannot rest if you weep too much. They will come back and beg you to let them rest. You can become a ghost seer by looking in through a hole in a coffin. This is especially true in some far northern countries, like Lithuania, for instance, where people leave little windows in the coffin so the dead can see out. You can see ghosts and spirits by peering at them from between a dog's ears. It is well known that dogs can see ghosts. So if you look steadily from between a dog's ears in the direction the dog is looking, you will see the same ghost he sees. You can see ghosts sometimes if you gaze steadily through a ring. If you look through a keyhole, you'll either see a ghost or the devil. In fact, there's no telling what you might see. Better not. Just say you aren't scared. Just say how brave and nonchalant you'd be if you ever saw a ghost. And see what happens. A horn book for witches, the besom. When full gallop they would speed to a coven far away, thrifty witches use a steed economical, the broom. This asks neither stall nor groom, never runs a bill for hay. The familiar, mangy lean of evil fame, subject to her own dark laws, Old Grimalkin tells her dame ancient lore that all cats know, and their secret, how to show friendship while you flex your claws. The Magic Circle Here within this potent round, which, secure from harm, may stay. Safety lies in circles, bound in such mystic cipher goes earth and all the world's. Who knows what grim shapes it keeps at bay? Enchanted Sleep Vivian the Limmer lass, Stepping from the fairy lake, Bound Merlin in tree of glass With her cup of magic dwale. Now she lies, so ends each tale, In sleep of death, no spell can break. Magician's Hat like a steeple to the skies soared the occult headdress, once worn with pride by adept wise. Round the brim the zodiac whirled in scarlet thread, alack, now this cap denotes the dunce. Which is wheel? By the turning of this wheel, faithfulness in hearts of men, young enchantresses can seal. Circe long ago did hold such a toy, yet we are told... Ulysses never came again. The spells. There are words of awful might that each witch wife must be learning. If the runes are spoken right, fiends will hasten to obey. Let the tongue slip. Neighbors may suddenly smell something burning. The coven. Cross-legged on the sarsen stone, Satan sits with staghorn crown, witches kneeling by his throne wonder at his mask in fear. Is it sin in person here? Likely just a clerk from town. The Covenant Writ on scroll of felon's skin with her blood for evil's sake is her name. Now she is kin to Pamphila, Ender, Bork, Lucifer will bless her work and reward her with the stake. Witches on the Heath Three witches danced on the heath last night, dancing widdishins round a tree. Wildly widdishins whirled the three under a wild and cloud-swept sky, while a goblin moon rode high over the hill where the old stones lie. 
and their hats were peaked, and they twittered and squeaked as they danced in the green moonlight. And out of the boughs of the twisted thorn came the wail of a violin, queer and evil and sad and thin. And though there was nobody one could see, somebody played in the twisted tree queer sad tunes for the witches three, till a lost wind crept from the hills and wept, and the farm cocks crowed up the morn. All Saints' Eve. Look, there beyond the window pane, through the withered and rattling vine, a wee face spangled with silver rain, lovely and wan, stares in at mine, white as a shell upon the sands, where the black billows break and pass. Something is pressing tiny hands against the barrier of the glass. Something eerie and fey and pale is peering in from the haunted night. At our small room, snug from the angry gale, where faces glow in the firelight, slant strange eyes under sea-green hair, look wistfully in through the window pane. Quick, open the casement. What is there that cries in the wind and the streaming rain? It is gone. It is gone. There is nothing there, blown by the storm to our window pane. Only the night and the chill sea air and the voice of the sorrowful rain. Dreamland by a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an Eidolon named Night on a black throne reigns upright, I have reached these lands but newly, from an ultimate dim thule, from a wild weird clime that lieth sublime, out of space, out of time. Bottomless vales and boundless floods and chasms and caves and titan woods with forms that no man can discover for the tears that drip all over. Mountains topping evermore into seas without a shore, seas that restlessly aspire, surging unto skies of fire, lakes that endlessly outspread their lone waters, lone and dead, their still waters still and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the lakes that thus outspread their lone waters, lone and dead, their sad waters, sad and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the mountains near the river, murmuring lowly, murmuring ever, by the grey woods, by the swamp, where the toad and the newt encamp, by the dismal tarns and pools, where dwell the ghouls. By each spot the most unholy, in each nook most melancholy, there the traveller meets aghast, sheeted memories of the past, shrouded forms that start and sigh as they pass the wanderer by, white-robed forms of friends long given in agony to the earth and heaven. For the heart whose woes are legion is a peaceful, soothing region. For the spirit that walks in shadow, tis, oh, tis an El Dorado. But the traveler, traveling through it, may not, dare not, openly view it. Never its mysteries are exposed to the weak human eye unclosed. So wills its king, who hath forbid the uplifting of the fringed lid, and thus the sad soul that here passes beholds it, but through darkened glasses, by a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an Eidolon named Night on a black throne reigns upright, I have wandered home but newly, from this ultimate dim fury. The Sands of Dee O Mary, go and call the cattle home, and call the cattle home, 
and call the cattle home across the sands of Dee. The western wind was wild and dank with foam, and all alone went she. The western tide crept up along the sand, and o'er and o'er the sand, and round and round the sand, as far as I could see. The rolling mist came down and hid the land, and never home came she. Oh, is it weed or fish or floating hair, a tress of golden hair, a drowned maiden's hair above the nets at sea? Was never salmon yet that shone so fair among the stakes on Dee. They rowed her in across the rolling foam, the cruel crawling foam, the cruel hungry foam, to her grave beside the sea. But still the boatmen hear her call the cattle home across the sands of Dee. Don't. Don't ever brag about what you do if you saw a ghost, or one will surely come. Don't slam the door because you might pinch some poor soul in it. Don't leave sharp knives lying around either, or some wandering spirit or ghost might get cut with them. Don't go looking over the graveyard wall. If you do, you will see ghosts. Don't laugh at ghosts. They are no joke. In Germany, they say, don't bring an elder branch into the house because ghosts will come in with it. If ever you come upon an old hat or a piece of clothing lying on the ground with a stick across it, don't pick it up. The stick is a sign that it belongs to a ghost. Don't touch it. Don't yawn without covering your mouth with your hand. Ghosts are attracted by yawning. Some people say they will peer in and count your teeth or your fillings. But a very common belief in the world is that your soul can slip out when you yawn and some ghost can slip in. If this happens, you will sicken and die. Don't ever speak to a ghost unless you really want it to answer. Because ghosts have to answer as soon as spoken.